Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the channel. I hope you can all hear me very well, wherever you may be. This is really exciting because it's the first time we are live on Zasa Photo, and I'm driving this new channel now so that you can enjoy both the astronomy and the eagle photography. So this is a free channel, and you can follow me around the world in both my passions. Hopefully you'll be there. Just say hi. I've got the live chat open. I can see you. I hope you can all hear me very well. It should be sometimes during live uh, broadcast, there are some hiccups. So I've got two monitors open. Uh, it's happened before that a computer crashes, but I should be able to, <laughs> to communicate with you on one of these two channels. Anyway, hi, I've seen some of my friends here from Westeros in Sweden, where I used to live. I've seen some from Brazil, where we'll be going shortly to um, Campinas, in fact. So it's very nice to see you all around the world. Very welcome. There's Hal, my good friend. Very nice. Good to see you. Water Mish 99, very nice to see you. You're almost, you're all very, very welcome here. And feel free to ask questions. The nice thing about the YouTube channel is if I don't see your comments immediately, I will certainly pick them up in a few minutes. So, this is all very exciting because you will be following me around the world in the eagle and the astronomy world. So, welcome. So, let me just show you how this. Uh, uh, how, how this runs. So, uh, iTelescope is sponsoring the session, which is really fantastic. Hi, hi, Kbob2. I, I see, I remember, I don't know who's the person behind that, but I, I do remember that, um, that, that handle. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, David. Good to see you from Colorado. Very welcome. Good to see you all. Fantastic. It's going to be very exciting today. Uh, to see you. Anyway, so iTelescope is sponsoring me, which is really fantastic. They they are basically giving us access to their wonderful telescopes, which I'm showing you here. So thank you to iTelescope. I will be there mid-July to end of July and show you as we go through the weeks and months ahead, we will be using these telescopes and I'll be uh, using them to show you the most beautiful objects in the Southern Hemisphere. So thank you to our sponsors, iTelescope. That's a view of the open roof. And as I said, I will be doing some live sessions uh, from mid to end July from there. Okay, so let's get right to it now. Why the southern sky and what is so marvelous and what actually happened in Australia? So in, in mid-April, so it was very recent, I embarked on a very adventurous trip. I landed in, um, in Sydney and then I took a, a camper van all by myself, and I went into the middle of nowhere, as I would like to say. Actually, that is where, if you go northwards, about north, it's it's approximately northwest. No, sorry, it's it's yeah, it is northwest uh, from uh, from from. No, sorry, it's northeast. No, sorry, northwest. No, sorry, got it. I just got my directions wrong. It is quite north northwest. Uh, you get go to a place called Dubbo, D U B B O. It's a few hours drive, and from there you come to a place called Coonabarabran, and that's in Siding Spring, and it's surrounded by a beautiful park called the Warren Bungo Park. And I took this self uh, selfie image with the Milky Way in the background. You can see my me with the camper van, and it's just moonlit. Okay, so we just had a very soft crescent moon there, and it's a 30 second exposure, and you can see what wonderful things you can do all by yourself. <laughs> Most wonderful selfies. That's another one, just another view that I can give you. Um, you can see Orion. You recognize Orion there? I'm just going to put the arrow uh, up so you can see where Orion is. Uh, that's Orion. From the Northern Hemisphere, you would say Orion is upside down here. <laughs> so indeed, it's upside down. And you can even see the Orion Nebula. If you look carefully, right on top, you can see the, the Orion Nebula. It's quite fantastic what you can do nowadays with cameras. Uh, and that's the uh, crescent moon looking. Uh, I was able, to, can you imagine, I was able to set up my cameras in the middle of the road. There was nobody. They were only kangaroos. It was quite remarkable, that experience. So I had these a uh, few very, very clear nights, which which is a dream for, for astrophotography. 
Okay, so let me get to the topic now. It's all about star trails. And you've, you've probably seen these before. You've seen light trails. What are light trails? What are star trails? Well, as the word says, they are trails. If you've ever seen these beautiful night images, people opening their cameras in bulb mode, and you just expose, you can see the, the streets flooded with red lights or white lights, depending on the direction of the traffic. And that's very similar in the sky because as the vehicles move, as a Ferris wheel moves and so on, and leaves these beautiful light trails behind, we have very similar patterns in the sky. And that is because our Earth rotates. And so these, this, it looks, it seems to us as all the, the, the complete skies rotating, of course it's our Earth, and the apparent rotation causes trails. And I'm going to keep it very simple today. I'm not going to jump into any Photoshop or anything. You'll be surprised. I want everybody to see it's simple to do. If you understand the basics, I will actually be giving you more practical tutorials directly from Australia wherever possible, if the weather allows. So I'm going to concentrate more on a very simple imaging processing technique that I used to do these, uh, the, these images. Typically, if you look in our northern hemisphere where we are, depending on the latitude, the more north you are, the higher the north star or Polaris will be in the sky. That represents the latitude we have. And that's also the northern pole where we will see the apparent rotation of the Earth. So if you open the shutter and just hold it against the night sky, you will get concentric rings. In fact, if you used an old film and you just kept on superimposing images, you would get these star trails. Nowadays, in the digital age, it is a lot easier. So all you do is you do some, uh, you would do a typical 30 second exposure, and I'll give you the, the, um, the settings just in a minute or two, and you can get quite simple, it's, there's no rocket science behind this, you'll get these beautiful star trails, and if you illuminate an object in front, and this was taken in Moab in the beautiful Arches National Park. I would really strongly recommend you go there. And if you are interested, I've, um, I will be showing, uh, holding a workshop next year with a friend of mine in Moab. It's all about astrophotography. If you want to learn a lot of the details, just join us. I've, I've written the details there and I've also given a link below. So feel welcome, it's a whole week. And we have lots of time. We've done this before a few times. It's been quite successful and I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, so let's get to it now. So I've got just simple, nowadays you have got so many cameras. Hi everyone from France. <laughs> That's very good, Gérard. Very good, 30 seconds uh, will let a star trail. Uh, that short a time frame. Yes, I will explain to you what I mean, okay? I'll explain exactly. You'll, it's a good question, and it's a bit confusing what I've just said. Hang on, just hang on tight. I'm going to explain, okay? <laughs> so first of all, the cameras that you can use for astrophotography. Nowadays, we've got these fantastic 360 cameras. You've probably uh, heard about the Theta S. Uh, if you've seen some published on the internet, you can see the International Space Station uh, photography and so on. As long as your camera is manually controllable, you will be able to do star trails and absolutely magnificent stuff. They are the Sony mirrorless. There's a whole myriad of mirrorless cameras coming out. They're all fantastic. As long as they have the possibility for you to control the shutter with a timer, preferably still use an external shutter that you can connect for just a few dollars. Then of course you have a whole range you can do astrophotography well under $1,000. Hi from California, Trudy. Very nice to have you. You can use Canon or Nikon. I've just uh, given you a range of possibilities here, all the way to the top range cameras, the full frame Nikon and the full frame uh, Canon. And of course the Sonys are there, the Pentax. I, I don't want to give anyone any preference here. They all work. The lens is really the important part. What is also important, and I'm just going to I'm just going to give you a quick run through this because it's much better I show you this in a practical sense. Okay, have a good tripod, 
Have a good tripod head so you can turn your tripod in all directions. At night time, many silly things happen. You will trip over the tripod. I promise these things happen. They happen to me. They happen to everyone. And some disasters happen. Somebody bumps against it. So just watch out. A remote shutter is very good to have. Have, have good lighting there. Lighting is very important. Nowadays, you have these wonderful LED lamps. Make sure you have enough batteries. Make sure you have good synchronization of your camera. So you have GPS coordinates and you have very, very good time because when you do a whole sequence of images, you want the exact time. That's really important. And watch out for humidity. Weather can change. Your lens can clock up very quickly. Those of you who do a lot with telescopes and so on will know that. Hi from the Astronomy Mobile Outreach Program in Southwest Virginia. Welcome, Mike. Nice to have you here. You're very nice to see you all. And just keep on running your comments. I'm keeping my eye on it. I've got a lot of monitors open. <laughs> Humidity can be an enemy, especially for the wide angle lenses, because uh, you know, you come to the fish eye and the fish eye extends all the way to the rim of the frame. And uh, thus you will get incredible temperature gradients across them. And that will cause your lens to clog up very quickly. Just some quick set things about the set settings. ISO, you, uh, depending on what your cameras allow. If you take a 360 degree camera, the Theta S, which is a beautiful uh, I'm, and I'm not <laughs> running this for Theta S or anything. I've just seen something that really was wonderful in Earth and Sky. You probably know the online magazine. I've seen this wonderful. Um, somebody did a stacking Im stacked image of the uh, International Space Station. Was thrilled. The ISO of the uh, Theta S goes all the way up to 16, uh, 1600, and he did a 60 second exposure. So it doesn't matter. I typically use 6400. Depends on the noise level. Make sure your focus is fine. Uh, very, very uh, wide angle lenses are very forgiving. The, the, the longer the focus, the less forgiving they are, the more attention you have to pay. Really difficult focus on a bright star. I will give you all the details live. It's much better. White balance around 4,500 Kelvin is a good value to have. Shoot in RAW if possible. You don't have to. It's not necessary. But RAW gives you a lot more options later to correct uh, collect for a uh, correct for color temperature and so on and leave your aperture wide open typically open or one stop less make sure you have sufficient memory sufficient memory and batteries for goodness sake i've seen people <laughs> they come they have all the camera gear and they forget memory it's really awful but these things happen so make sure you do a checklist it happens to everyone a quick overview of the different lenses that are available there's a simple rule, and I won't uh, get too much into it. It's called the 500 rule. It is just you take, so you take, um, here's a list of lenses that go all the way from 8 millimeter to 35 millimeters. Those are typical uh, lenses that we use for astrophotography for doing the Milky Way. The shorter the lens uh, focal length, the more forgiving it is, the less star trails you will see. So initially what you want to do is you want to take sharp images. Why do you want sharp images and not trails in the beginning? Because those sharp images can serve another purpose. You can do beautiful, uh, beautiful, uh, uh, um, beautiful uh, close-ups of the Milky Way and other objects, and you can really blow them up nicely if you've got good camera resolution. So you might as well use single uh, single images too before you go and do some star trails. And there's the famous 500 rule, which just means you take the number 500, you divide it by the focal length, that's the fourth column. Let me just see if I can get an arrow there so I don't confuse you too much here. Um, there we go. Okay. So I'm talking about this column here. I'm talking about this column here. That is the 500 rule. 500 divided by the focal length gives you the approximate time that is forgiving for you not to see significant star trails. I actually use the 360. Ah, there we, I like loose leaf greetings. I see Jennifer from Connecticut. Hi, very good. What is the astrophoto rating? Yes, what is that rating? That's a good question. This is the this is, the rating is a multiplication factor where they where where basically the aperture 
uh, is multiplied by the um, by, by the focal length and a few other small tricks gives you a certain rating. It's an arbitrary number. It's not an absolute number. I took this off a website. So it gives you an indication of how good your lens is, but it's not the absolute truth because uh, it is an indication. It does tell you a little bit about, and I'm just going to point my arrow there. One second, let me just take my arrow. Um, Take my arrow there if I can. Let's see if I can do this. One second. Oops. Not sure if I can. My arrow won't move at the moment. Oh, now it's moving. Now it's moving. Now it's moving. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So the question was, what is? What are the ratings for? Well, the so the ratings are some some um, some multiplications that we do here with the columns uh, to to give some type of ratings, and you can see that the higher the rating, the more suitable the lens is. So all these lenses are very suitable, but if you go all the way to 50 millimeters, it gets more and more difficult. So just take this as an indicative number. For example, the 24 millimeter f1.4, uh, which I love to use. I'm just going to show you the, oops, no, that's the wrong, that was the wrong, um, there we go. There's the f1.4. Uh, Get, has quite a high rating. It gives very, very sharp images and it's extremely fast. So it's something about the speed, the, 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 the larger the F ratio, no, sorry, the smaller the F ratio, sorry about that. The smaller the F ratio, the, the, the faster your lens is. So an, a lens of 1.4, the 24 millimeters is extremely fast and that is reflected. That is where I can show you the Milky Way live, okay? But it doesn't mean that it is necessarily a better lens. So take it with a pinch, you know, just be a little bit careful with the rating. It just uh, is some arbitrary number. Don't put too much value into this, okay? So just to give you an idea of what different images look like. So this here is a 14 millimeter and you can see uh, taken up straight from the um, Milky Way. That's a 15 second exposure and you get a lot of details. This is more or less a raw image, completely um, unedited. And if I edit it, all the beautiful colors and details will come out. And then if you go to a 6 millimeter fisheye, and that was the um, lens that I used a lot in Australia, you can get a lot more. So it's not only the focal length, it is whether it is a fish eye or not. So don't be misled by the fact that the one is a 14 and the other is a 60 millimeter. It also depends whether the, it is a fish eye, but it is not a 180 degree lens, but it gives you quite a lot of the beautiful Milky Way taken in the early evening here in Siding Spring. And then I'll quick um, image here of the 24 uh, using the 24 millimeter now what is incredible of course as you get with high magnification the milky way really starts sticking out a lot and then you see i illuminated the foreground here uh, just with my camper van just quickly giving giving um with parking lights a short flash and it gives you a very very warm foreground Okay. And my friend in Westeros, who, who, uh, Timo, who's listening in now, oh, there's a question here. Do you use this lens wide open? Yes. You, usually, you know, the, the, um, that's a great question. I usually go one stop down simply because no lens is perfect. Okay. From an optical point of view, it's not perfect. And it's, not, it's impossible to build the perfect lens because there is chromatic aberration and many, many other factors placing into being going to a lens. So what you do is you go one stop down. Instead of leaving completely open, you go one stop down. And the lenses are usually that good so that you can you can avoid a lot of very heavy vignetting. Vignetting means that it gets darker towards the edges of the lens. Okay, that's called vignetting. That has to do with the imperfection of the lens itself. If it were a perfect lens, you wouldn't have any of this. So, uh, so that's a great question, but usually you can leave it wide open. I usually, when I have my 1.4, I would be running at 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, because nowadays you can choose fractions of the aperture. Okay. This is my, my, my friend here, Timo Investoros, who's helped me annotate 
and just show you how incredibly beautiful the southern sky is. There are so many objects here. So he's much faster than I. I did this together with him. Thank you, Timo, for helping me here. So you can see a lot of details, a lot of the famous Messier objects. Messier objects, Messier was a very famous comet hunter who lived in Paris. And it means that from the location of Paris, at that time it was very dark in Paris, he was naming all the nuisance objects, which were non comets by, and they were, they were named after him, called Messier. So you can see a lot of the, um, the beautiful details here can in fact be seen from Paris, which is latitude 49 north, by the way. But it is at quite a low angle, so the more south you go, if you're in Hawaii, you will beautifully see a lot of Sag Sagittarius already. And as you go more and more south, uh, the um, Sagittarius, which is the center of our, the, the galactic center, or where the big black hole is, be, is supposed to be, by the way, and I will point it out quickly to you because Timo found it for me. It's quite difficult, um, you know, it's quite difficult to, to, uh, to find because um, you have to read star maps upside down in all kinds of different orientations. Here comes a comment from Mike. Most more expensive high-speed lenses like the 300 f2.8 are optically designed for wide open, but less expensive lenses should be stopped down. That is absolutely a good remark, Mike. Yes, absolutely true. Some of the um, absolutely true if the 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 less expensive lenses of course use cheaper materials and you will find a lot more dispersion and optical imperfection so that's a very good point and you can actually with the 300 f 2.8 is an extremely fast lens and you can leave it wide open i do exactly the same with a 24 millimeter or so very good point especially for prime lenses that is true thank you so there's our galactic center. That is the black hole that is about 25,000 light years away. No danger there. <laughs> Just to point out this, the beauty of the southern sky. So let's jump into the tutorial now. There was a question about uh, star trails. Just before I do that, I just wanted to quickly point out, uh, if you like what I'm doing, don't forget to uh, go to your channel settings and you see where the subscribe button is. Let me just get the arrow there. One second to the subscribe. Oops, that's the wrong, that was the wrong uh, window. Um, yep, there we go. It's right up there is the subscribe button. Be sure there's next to the subscribe button is a, uh, should be a little bit up more. There we go. It's not, not, not in the, quite in the right position there. But next to the subscribe button is a bell, which you cannot see at the moment. Okay, so be sure that you press the bell and you will get notifications whenever I'm live. Okay, if that's something that appeals to you, fine. If you find it a nuisance, don't worry about it. It just helps you get a notification because they are not auto enabled and they should never be auto enabled. Okay, hi from Calcutta, India. That's fantastic. San, so here is it, Santunu, very welcome from all the way from uh, Calcutta. I think you have an incredible uh, um, time difference. You should be late at night now. So thank you for joining us. That is great. So let's jump out of this now and get to Star Trails. So I promised you I would not use anything and I would make it very, very simple, anything that costs something. So in order to do that, what you would do is... If you Google Star Trail software, there are so many great astro um, astro photographers who who are offering all this. Hi, Mark, you're also there. That is great. And add email notifications. Yes, Pamina. Hey, they're all my friends there from uh, Periscope. That is great. Really crazy questions, but there any capabilities with the iPhone? Huh. Now you caught me. <laughs> Maybe somebody can answer that. Oh, so it's 20. So it's not that late in Calcutta. That's great. I have to give this, pass this on to some expert. If there's some, some I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But uh, it may be possible. You know, there's so much done with the apps now. But if you type into Google Star Trail software, this is what you would typically come up with. And you can take any of them. Uh, I'm going to use Star Trails. I'm running at the moment. Um, I'm actually running both a Mac here and a 
a PC, but you can use any of these softwares. They're great people. They give all the software for free. So just do it. Hi from Adeline. That's very, that's, that's great. Uh, uh, sorry, no, it's Adel, sorry. What am I saying? Adel, Adel Dale. Sorry, got it wrong. Uh, <laughs> Cameron, sorry, I wasn't reading it properly. Hi, very welcome. So you can use any of these. Uh, so I'm just going to tap. I use this one at the moment. Uh, uh, it's a German software and I'm going to use this for Star Trail. So let's jump straight in. You have them for the Mac. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're also there for the iPhone, but I haven't checked the iPhone yet. It would be maybe a little bit more difficult to do. Okay, let's jump in. Um, good. So I will first jump into my folder. Uh, where is my folder here? Mm. There we go. This is this folder. That's the folder I'm looking for, for today. So this is typically what a, a, um, a night will look like. I'm going to open one of these images, okay? And these are raw images. So someone just said, how can you make, make star trails from 30 second images, okay? How is that possible? So I'm just going to get rid of the arrow one second. And that the arrow shouldn't be there. There, that's better. That's better. Sorry about that. Sometimes I forget to, to remove the arrow because I'm looking so at so many screens at the same time. But this is the typical view that you would get um, in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, So make sure that you follow the 500 or better the 360 rule so that you don't get star trails when you zoom in. Very, very important because you want to use these single images too. So what you do is you would run through a whole night and I'm just going to run the sequence here and you can see what happens. As I slowly move forward, the sky is moving apparently at about a quarter degree per minute, which equates to 15 degrees per hour. That is quite a lot. So you can follow the rotation here as I go from 30 second image from a 30 second image to the next. The sky is slowly rotating. By the way, on the right, you can see the beautiful satellite, um, the satellite uh, galaxy to our Milky Way, the large Magellanic cloud, which was used for navigation. Really beautiful here in the early evening of April. Okay, so you do these, you take these images and you go and you stack them automatically. As I said, I will go into the proper tutorial live of how you actually take these images later. So once you've done that, you end up with these incredible massive um, files here with all, all your images. And that's why I said it's very, very important to be sure that the timestamp is correct on all of them. Okay. We are working on that. I found an app called and that get you save images in raw. That's interesting. And take darks and say thank you for that. That's interesting. That that is good to know. Um, a lot of these Star Trail um, softwares, by the way, only work with JPEGs. They don't necessarily take the raw. Maybe there are some now that that do. But I I transferred all of my raw images to JPEG just to show you this, so it will also go faster. So this is a folder full of JPEGs. So let's jump straight into the software. So you've done that, and then you open this very simple, very very nicely done uh, app. Um, a software called Star Trails. So let's do it. I'm going to open it now and I'm going to take a few of the images. Let's see, where are we? Um, here it is. So you can see I started in the early evening and so on. I'm just going to take some images, not too many because otherwise we're going to run forever here. So let's just choose at random a few images and import them. So I say open and there you go. They've been imported. That moment is just a short time is nine blown. Yes, isn't it? What you can do nowadays with software, with, with cameras is amazing. You can capture really thousands, virtually millions of stars in just 30 seconds. And it's absolutely mind blowing. It is an experience that you have to have one day. So I imported these images and then I go to build. So I'm going to here to build. Um, open that and I just say star trails. Okay, so it gives you several options to do star trails. I'm going to take what you call the light and you can do this in Photoshop too, but it's going to take a lot longer. So what it does now, it's basically taking all the images and superimposing them, letting all the images stacking. They are stacked now. They are there. It's one above the other and they're letting the light shine through every single image. So here we go and watch now the software is doing it. You can see what's happening now. I'm doing all this live. You can see one image is superimposed over the next and there come the star trails. Beautiful. 
Okay, so you can see what's happening with the Milky Way. Look, look what's happening with a large Magellanic cloud. <laughs> it's uh, it's rapidly, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's 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 rapidly um, being processed there. And we can go on and on, and you can see I've got 200, I arbitrarily chose 212 images there. And the longer you do it, the more perfect your star trails are going to be. Okay, so that's the answer. That's how we do this nowadays. You could have just as well, if you had a camera with very low ISO, you could have just left it open on bulb mode, and you could have done exactly the same. The only disadvantage is, is you have there, if you do anything wrong, your whole image is gone, right? There could be a satellite, there could be somebody who shines a torch into uh, into your direction and so on. Everything would be spoiled. So it's much better to do it this way. I'm just going to abort anyway here now and say, okay, use a break and let's export the image. I'm not going to use any Photoshop. I just want to show you how quickly we can do this. So I'm going to save the image now and I'm going to call it test star trails. That's fine. Let's call it test. Uh, test star trails and let's jump in and take a look at the result. So here's test star trails. We open it and I just use the Windows editor. You have the same in the Mac and the iPhone and so on. I've just opened it and let's just do a, a very quick edit on this. Okay, so I go to adjust here and I'm just pulling the light. It's a little bit too, um, too bright. I'm just going to turn up the clarity a little bit and give it a little bit more color. And already the result, without Photoshop or anything, looks absolutely great. And you can see how what is interesting about the Southern Hemisphere, and that's really mind-blowing. You can see the effects of the, of the large Magellanic cloud, and you can see certain traces. But there's one sad thing, all the details have disappeared. And that's what prompted me to rethink the method of star trails and I said well why do we do it like that it's it's it looks nice and there's so many beautiful star trails on the internet but why not do it a little bit different uh, if we take images not in 30 seconds but let's assume we took them every hour so let's say and I'm going to jump back to our folder now to show you this let's jump back to our um, our astro folder and I have selected images here with larger with larger gaps now. So instead of taking them every 30 seconds, I'm now taking them at, I think these are 20 minute. These are 20, oops, one second, something crashed here. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. So I'm taking them in 20 minute intervals and you can see that what happens here. This is 20 minutes and you can see the beautiful rotation of the night sky. That's the small Magellanic cloud coming up in the early morning. And you can see the beautiful Eta Carina, by the way. Let me put my arrow there. It's a an incredibly, um, it's a very, very beautiful, very intense nebula called the Eta Carina. I'm just going to point my, um, point my arrow there. You can see that, that it's very similar to our beautiful Orion Nebula, only it's much, much more intense. So all this, these details you can take in 30 seconds. And that's why I say don't throw your images away. Make sure you have all the beautiful uh, details. So that's just taken at a certain time. This would be typically around 11 p.m. At the end of March, the uh, Milky Way would be almost horizontal. Really beautiful, okay? And you can see the whole rotation. So let me get rid of the arrow again and go back. And there comes the rotation. So what happens now if we select these in 20 minute intervals or one hour intervals or any interval you may find interesting? And let's go back and see what happens. So we open our software again. There we go. Here it's open again. And I'm going to import the large time. I'm going to import all of these images just as we did before. There we go. I wonder if the rotation of the Earth contributes a lot to the speed of the Milky Way. Yes, of course it does. Indeed it does. What you see there uh, really uh, is no, it's not talking, you're, you, you don't see any movement of the stars or anything. They are moving very slow 
with respect to us and the, the uh, with respect to the Milky Way, but all the rotation is solely done. Thanks, Zach, for retweeting. I can just see <laughs> Zach here <laughs> uh, retweeting that this is live now. Thank you very much, Zach. Okay, so let's build an image from there. And this is going to be mind-boggling for you uh, because this is what I did. So watch this now. And this is what's happening now. It's building this in 20-minute intervals and doing exactly that. And you can see a beautiful pattern arising in the center. And you can see it looks almost fractal. And what you see to the right also, which is absolutely stunning, you can see the Magellanic cloud is painting across the sky now. And all these beautiful patterns are arising from the Southern Cross, from at that time it was Saturn, and all the bright stars will do these beautiful patterns. And also Eta Carina, the Eta Carina Nebula is also contributing a lot to the red. So let's save this image uh, very quick. And you can see how quick I did this. Very, very simple, using nothing. So I'm just saving this exactly under the same name. And let's edit it very quickly. Uh, so where it is, it is here. And again, I'm using no prior, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not using any Photoshop or here. I just want to keep it really simple. Let's get the light down a little bit and let's get the clarity up a little and give it a little bit more color. And there is your beautiful result. And that magic happened right in front of you. <laughs> and this is, I'm really showing to you this to you to get you excited about what is possible. These are patterns that are there to be discovered. And you can use different intervals. I use 20 minutes in this case, and you get this beautiful pattern. Isn't it a nice image? And we did it so quickly right in front of you. There's really no artifacts here. It is just a superposition of images and gives you beautiful results. By the way, very important, if you later, uh, sometimes you have um, images that you want to use but somebody's holding a torch in the foreground or a car comes in or something happens that's not perfect what you can do is you separate the foreground and with foreground I mean this for example okay I mean this is um, this is the foreground okay the foreground are the trees and so on sometimes they get illuminated isn't it amazing Pamina it is and it is a nice image so what you can do is you can extract the foreground with a little bit of work. It takes a little bit of work in Photoshop. Uh, you can separate it and then you can superimpose it on your image. And that way you get a beautiful foreground and the background, uh, you, you first do the complete image and later you superimpose the foreground and that gives you a beautiful resulting image. And that's it, my friends. That's how easy it is. <laughs> that is really simple. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. That's all I wanted to show you. And next time, what I do want to show you is um, I want to show you how to do these type of things. Okay, so do stay tuned. I'm going to show you how to do these beautiful animations once you have uh, collect once you have all the folders. This is all done from the same images. You can do the rotation. You can do these beautiful animations, in fact. Very easy to do. And you can have them rotate in any way you want. And in fact, this is not an artificial thing. This is a result of the images that I've taken. And you can make them rotate. And it's really fun. You can use them as screensavers. And you can see the Milky Way as a cosmic clock rotating. How many images did I stack in this case? Again, these are typically 20 minutes. Okay, that I think, if I remember correctly, was a 30 minute stack, okay? How do you separate foreground in Photoshop? I will show you that. I will show you that next time, okay? These are 30 seconds exposures, yes. Can you please tell me what should be the minimum exposure times? Oh, now this is, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a light polluted area, it is not easy because the exposure time is dictated by your light pollution, unfortunately. That is the problem. So I don't have a definite answer for that. So you will have to see because in a light polluted area, your, ex your, your, your night sky will become completely bright. And you will have to reduce your, your, you will not be able to expose 30 seconds. And unfortunately, it is about the signal to noise ratio. In this case, your Milky Way would be seen as noise and the signal 
would be would be uh, the foreground through the light scattering of your city and maybe through the humidity and so on. So unfortunately, that is very, very difficult, okay, because you need to get into contrast and you will have to do some tricks in Photoshop in order to to subtract the the uh, the, the glare of the night sky. Not easy. It's it, it can be done, but it is a lot more challenging. So you will have to go far under 30 seconds, okay? Use LPS filter. Here you go, Mike. Thank you for that, Mike. There are some filters that are some filters that will help you. They are not perfect. If you are lucky to be in a light polluted area where they use high pressure sodium lamps, that's wonderful because you can separate the sodium lights. Unfortunately, with with the increasing light pollution, we have broadband spectrum and it gets more and more difficult. But Mike is right. There are filters that do help. Very good. Maybe I missed it. Uh, what is the camera in these cases? Oh, in my case, I used a Nikon D810A. But you don't need to use that. You can use very simple cameras. You can use setups below $1,000. You can buy secondhand equipment nowadays. And what I've done here, you can do indeed with very simple equipment. Okay. Is it possible to do a tutorial for putting stars reflecting in a lake? Of course I can, and I will do a lot more of that. This is a beginner tutorial, and that gets us more. Our LPS, I don't know. Maybe, Mike, you can answer that question. Uh, I would believe that, 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 that a D90 would be possible because it's the, the, that's a DX lens, and I think these filters are probably available in different uh, sizes. But maybe Mike can uh, comment on that. But again, um, I'm glad you like these tutorials. I will be going much deeper in them. And if you want to spend more time with me, and I'm happy to spend the whole day with you, join our workshop and I've given you a link below. Okay, so hopefully that'll help you. Okay, there you go. Mike is answering the question. Okay, would be would love to see this on Moon showing Earth and and Milky Way possible. Yes, again, you can do it on on. Um, you can do that. I will I will try and do that in Australia. In fact, because I'm going there again mid July. So I hope you join me. Uh, I'll be, be doing a lot of that live, and you should be able to see some of this. You could do it with the Moon moving. Yes, you could. Google is your best friend, absolutely. <laughs> okay, okay, my friends. Well, yes, as seen in National Geographic, I have given given the yes, as seen. That's right. Mark helped. Um, yes, Mark actually. This this beautiful image that we did here uh, was was. Um, I think Mark, that is your editing actually that is done there. It's uh, so you can you can have the moon there. I won't stand there for two hours, okay? Um, if uh, but you would be able to see the rotating Milky Way if I stood completely quiet for two hours, and you would see the uh, the moon, especially the crescent moon. That that would actually look marvelous, okay? Thanks again, my friends. Have a good day, and and um, do remember. Tell your friends, just subscribe to my channel. I hope you enjoy it. Have a wonderful day and we have many exciting things ahead. Okay. So on that, that note, I will now jump back. Let me just see where I am. And um, there we go. Yeah, it says live now, by the way. That's good. All that seems to be working. And now I will just um, stop the stream. And you can continue giving comments and they will stay. So have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining. Tell your friends and run in your questions. I'm there to help. Tschüss und Tag. Tag so mücke. That's great. Thank you, my friends.